this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I'm Bishop William Byrne inviting you to radiate the light of Christ by making a gift to the annual Catholic Appeal. The ministries and agencies supported with your generosity help thousands of our neighbors throughout Western Massachusetts. On behalf of the people we serve, thank you. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Coming up on this edition of Real to Real, Advocating for children and adults with disabilities is very much a part of the pro-life message. I'm Carolee McGrath. I'll have the story coming up. I'm Steve Kiltonic in Chicopee. Well, I'll have the story of Marie Prometer's latest book, Growing Up French. And we'll take a nature walk with amateur photographer Deacon Pedro Rivera Moran as he captures pictures of God's creation. These stories are coming your way next on Real to Real. Hello and welcome again to Real to Real. October is Respect Life Month and fittingly enough also Down Syndrome Awareness Month. It's no secret that many expectant mothers feel pressured to abort after receiving a prenatal diagnosis of Down Syndrome. But as Carolee McGrath discovered in speaking with two families, these children are not only a blessing, but have taught them what it means to love. Eleven-year-old Jacob Elmer gets his little sister off the bus most afternoons. Six-year-old Jessica is the baby girl of the family and has everyone wrapped around her finger. Look at this! Look at that! Wow! A lot! A lot! Oh, your snack bag, okay. Yep. That's it? Jessica, who has Down syndrome, loves to draw. Whoa. Oh, who's that? Lion. Lion, what does a lion do? Whoa! <laughs> Do it again. What does the line do? That's right. She loves to write her letters and she loves an audience. Steve. What is it? See? Apple tree? Yeah. Oh. Tina Elmer, Jessica's mom, says when doctors realized Jessica had markers for Down syndrome on the ultrasound, they were concerned. When they had called and explained that there was um, some irregularities in the ultrasound, uh, they were highly encouraging us to have further testing done and to make decisions quickly so that we could decide whether to terminate, which we were not interested in at all. Tina says she and her husband Rick were scared about raising a child with special needs, but she wanted reassurance, some guidance, not pressure to get an abortion. Rick has three older children, making Jessica the baby of six. The Elmers belong to St. Stanislaus Basilica Parish in Chicopee, but sometimes attend Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament Parish in Westfield, which is close to their home. I think this is so important because of the pressure that we received when we first got the ultrasound report. Um, again, if we didn't have each other, if I was alone, if I was young, I just felt like it would have been so easy to just fall into the direction the doctors were pushing us. October is Down Syndrome Awareness Month in addition to Respect Life Month. The Elmers say little Jessica has brought nothing but joy to everyone, a much different picture than was painted for them by medical professionals. She, she's just like adorable and wherever, wherever she goes, wherever she goes she always spreads joy to the world and she's He's always active. He's always at baseball games making new friends. When I play hockey, she's always up in the stands and before I play my game, I always walk over to there and put my hand on the glass and then she would do the same. So then I would always pat it and she would always start laughing. Jessica sometimes walks the golf course with her dad and older brother Josh. We couldn't imagine life without her. You know, she's. Uh, you know, it keeps us busy, keeps us young, keeps us on our toes, you know, so. <laughs> Advocating for children and adults with Down syndrome is a very important part of the pro-life ministry. But the reality is most women who receive a prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome choose to abort. According to the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, that number is 67% in the United States. In Iceland, nearly 100% of babies prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted, according to the European Down Syndrome Association. The doctors seem to uh, push us more towards 
pregnant. terminating the pregnancy than saying what options we really had. I mean, when we left the office, you know, they made it sound like, um, like, you know, that was the only option. Matthew Butler's mom, Michelle, was also told to make a decision when it was discovered that he had Down syndrome. 18 years later, he's crushing it at basketball. He's a uh, USP basketball. He plays golf with his dad's friend quite a lot over at Edgewood. Does some Special Olympics basketball, soccer. Matthew is the youngest of five children. He also plays the drums and is in the Westfield High School Band. He loves WWE and John Cena. Last year, Michelle lost her husband, Mike. He and Matt were inseparable. How are you at golf? Good, and um, I play golf with my dad, Fred Zambola. Michelle says she hopes to help people see what the doctors clearly missed. It's a human life, regardless with a diagnosis or not, they're still just as important and loving and caring that just to have the diagnosis of, um, you know, prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome is not a death sentence. It's a, if I were to do it all over again, I would. My husband said to me, well, he's going to be the happiest kid alive. So, and it's true, he's a very happy kid. Brings a lot of joy to a lot of people's lives. Both Matthew and Miss Jessica put a smile on people's faces without even trying. And they're certainly not defined by their diagnosis, but by God. Reporting for Real to Real in Westfield, I'm Carolee McGrath. What a moving story. Thanks so much, Carolee. And this past week, we celebrated the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of the environment and animals. In our next story, one of our diocesan deacons, Pedro Rivera Moran, director of Latino ministry, brings us closer to nature in the tradition of St. Francis as he captures God's creations through his camera lens. When Deacon Pedro Rivera Moran sees a beautiful sunset, a church steeple, a bridge of flowers, or water rushing from the banks of a river, he often captures those moments in pictures, each photo representing God's handiwork. And then Deacon Pedro, as part of his ministry, posts the pictures to his Facebook page. In midsummer, relating a walk in Westfield to scripture passages. I'm impressed with God's creative work as every day, at different times, one walks through the same place and always sees new things. Such is the Word of God. Every time you read something, even if you read it before, God tells you something different. It's both a hobby and a ministry for Deacon Pedro. In mid-August, we walked through Ashley Reservoir in Holyoke as he explained how he sees the world in terms of brush strokes that God has made. This is just fascinating. Way down over there, you can see the geese. Yeah. Um, you can see the multiple levels of color. Like over there, it's, it's kind of flat. Or over here, it's very shiny. Mm -hmm. um, and all those paint strokes that the Lord uses just to create this. There's such a diversity, like plants that grow in the water, trees, uh, birds. This is just... Then you can look at the sky, the beauty of those, those, those clouds. Uh, I'm always mesmerized that when I walk through this type of environment and, and just seem to enjoy it. He's not a professional photographer, mostly using his cell phone or a small 35 millimeter camera to capture images. This is going to be a tough picture. Seeing the beauty in everything you can see the sky reflected in the water, and so you, you kind of see that, that unity uh, of heaven and earth, if you will, which I really enjoy that. Even stopping to examine and reflect on the root of a tree. You see the shape of the roots it has no defined process. It just grows naturally. You get everything in it, rocks, dirt, sand, ground, uh, the, the pine cone, it's it just, natural framing that the Lord has done for us. It is important to stop and take root, says the deacon. 
people always look at the flowers, the, the trees, and, and the foliage, but there's a lot more that we miss when we look at the, at, at the beauty of just how things develop, and that's basically how God created it. Just how every tree and root and leaf are different, so are each one of us all part of God's great plan. When I come to a place like this, I, I just love to take a picture of what God has done. And, and I, I like to share and let people know the marvels of God's creation. And be sure to follow Deacon Pedro on Facebook to see more of his inspirational photos. We have a link to his Facebook page at iobserve.org. And still to come on this edition of Real to Real, a local author has written a new book about growing up with the French Canadian traditions in New England. And Dan Dumas joins us with the latest news from across Western Massachusetts. It's all still to come on Real to Real. Like Catholic TV on Facebook. Once you're there, you can join in on discussions, make friends with other Catholic TV fans, watch behind the scenes videos from the studio, and stay up to date with the Catholic world. All this at Facebook.com slash Catholic TV. I'm Dan Dumas with your Real to Real News Briefs. This past week, Pope Francis officially began the Synod on Synodality at the Vatican. Pope Francis opened the work of the Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, asking members to meditate on ancient theological texts about the Holy Spirit, have the courage to be honest about their disagreements, and focus much more on listening than on sharing their opinions. The synodal process, quote, is not easy, but it's beautiful, very beautiful, Pope Francis told some 364 synod members and 85 non-voting experts ecumenical delegates and facilitators the afternoon of October 4th as the Synod work began in the Vatican Audience Hall. This initial gathering will last the entire month, concluding on October 29th. A second Synod gathering is planned for October 2024. And you can stay informed on the Synod at iobserve.org, our Catholic news source. That's iobserve.org. Last Sunday, October 1st, St. Michael's Cathedral hosted the Red Mass, held annually on the first Sunday of October. The Mass organized by the St. Thomas More Legal Society had the cathedral filled with family and friends of this year's honorees. Nick Morganelli has the story. October is a reminder season for us to pray for the Holy Spirit to bless and give guidance to those who pursue justice. Red is the color for the fire of the Holy Spirit, as five in our justice system were chosen this year by the St. Thomas More Society as honorees. Judith Cross, Leonard Jekinowski, Thomas Downey, Maureen Tobin, and Paul Kingston. We ask you to bless these medals. Bishop William Byrne blessed and presented each of them with the distinctive medallion of St. Thomas More, who was a lawyer that stood on the principles of justice, was a patron of the poor, and helped to establish the parliamentary privilege of free speech. A reception brunch was held at Twin Hills Country Club in Longmeadow. During the program, the biography of each honoree was read by prior honorees. After leaving the seminary, Paul began a career spanning 40 plus years in education, social work, and lastly with the probation department of the Massachusetts Trial Court. I can't change someone else's life, but I can try to help them change their own lives. And that's, I think, the satisfaction that one receives in doing this work. Paul Kingston, now retired, served as chief probation officer for Hampshire County Superior Court for 36 years, and he believes his faith was instrumental in his work. When it comes to a life of faith, well, it's, you know, it's not a subject that we 
approach, but personally, I believe it helps. And um, I guess by your actions, one um, hopefully would see that you are a person, a man or woman of faith. And one of the award recipients, Judy Cross, is not only a woman of faith, but has strong family values too. She's always held a special place in all of our, me and my three sisters' hearts, because she's so active in our lives. So yeah, super cool, glad we could, we wouldn't miss this for the world. Judy has been a stalwart on many Catholic causes for several decades in Western Massachusetts. All of the skills that I've developed over the years, then the gifts that God has given me over the years, I'm now able to direct it to where it really matters. The one thing that's so important about this is exactly what was in the hymn we sang, as well as Bishop's homily, is that it's not just about serving in the legal profession, but it's serving in the legal profession and still being true to my Catholic faith. It's a very lonely walk sometimes. Um, but again, the Red Mass is something to remind us that we don't do that alone. I like the general public to know is that there's a lot of people in the courthouses who work for the justice system, a lot of lawyers, advocates, probation officers, and so forth, who care, who care about the right outcome, um, and that really believe in what justice is all about. Recognizing this year's St. Thomas More Society honorees for Real to Real, I'm Nick Morganelli. Now to Chicopee, where the College of Our Lady of the Elms has greatly improved its status on two listings in the 2024 U.S. News & World Report Best Colleges Rankings, and was listed as a best value school in the North Region for the first time. In the North Region, the college jumped 33 places to number 60 on the list of best regional universities, and rose 22 slots to number 12 in the top performers on social mobility category. This list ranks schools for enrolling and graduating large proportions of students who have received federal Pell Grants. New this year, Elms College was ranked number 33 on the best value schools. This category examines a school's academic quality and the cost of its programs. The higher the quality of the programs and the lower the cost, the better the value a school provides. And finally today, parish educators were honored for their many years of dedication and service at the third annual Founders Day presentation at St. Mary's in Westfield. Steve Kiltonic has the story. On September 9th, a special mass was held at St. Mary's in Westfield to celebrate the recipients of the 2023 Founders Day Award. Honored were eight individuals who were either religious education directors, teachers, or contributors, as well as two in-memory honorees. Those recognized include Joanne Baggy, Kay Moat, Mary Lou Hatton, Carolyn Lowry, Paul McKenna, and Bonnie Queenan. Jean Beltrandi, Connie Patton, and Lucy Rios were also honored, but were not able to be present. Donna Kane and Betsy Casson were also recognized in memory. Sister Jane Morrissey accepted on behalf of her sister, Donna. Founders Day is St. Mary's way of honoring individuals who have contributed in some special way to the parish over the years. They've worked for decades, over a combined 160 years, the people we have today. And they just did an incredible job of, of teaching the gospel and spreading the gospel. Father Salatino said as a group they had one commonality. A joyful faith, all of them. They really live, they live their faith, they believe their faith, but they're, they're, they got a joy about them that was contagious. Joanne Baggy served 20 years as the director of the sixth graders through high school. I loved working as a team. We had a wonderful team of people that I worked with. And we had fun. We laughed every day. Altogether, Kay Moat served 28 years, 20 years of which was as the director of the younger kids. Well, we used lots and lots of volunteers who always came with great ideas and we worked together as a team to come up with new ideas and it was great because we had the families that supported us so that was always nice. Paul McKenna who instructed parish teens during the 1990s commented on what he enjoyed the most as an educator. Just meeting so many of these young men and women that have so much to offer with all their, they have a lot of energy, they want to make a difference in the world. During Mass, Robin Jensen announced the big news, 
a grant of $300,000 was given to the parish by an anonymous donor. After Mass, a reception was held in a newly renovated parish hall. Congratulations to the Father's Day class of 2023 for the important role each played in the spiritual growth of St. Mary's youth over the past 50 years. For Real to Real, I'm Steve Kiltonic. You can read more on these and other stories at iobserve.org, where you can find articles from our Catholic communication staff, as well as on-demand episodes of Real to Real. That's iobserve.org. I'm Dan Dumas, and those were your Real to Real news briefs. You are watching Real to Real, your window on the world around you. Here again is your Real to Real host, Sharon Rulier. And finally today, local author Marie Pru Meter has come out with a new book about growing up French here in Western Massachusetts. Steve Kiltonic sat down with the Chicopee native to talk about what inspired her to write about the French Canadian experience in New England. Marie Pru Meter has always been proud of her French heritage. She served as the director of the French Heritage Center for five years and was a contributor to the 2015 book, Building a Better Life for the French Canadians in Western Massachusetts. The author of Many Faces, One Mary, featuring area gardens and shrines to Our Lady, Prue Meter's lifelong passion for French history and culture inspired her to pen her latest book, Growing Up French, a collection of Franco-American interviews. My main goal was you know, to preserve the past for future generations because I felt like, you know, we were losing our heritage. And so also I wanted to provide insight into what it was like growing up French. Between 1840 and 1930, 1 1.5 million French Canadians emigrated to New England and neighboring states, many to work in the textile mills of Chicopee and Holyoke. Growing up in Chicopee, French traditions were passed on to Marie and her two siblings at an early age. When my parents would get together with relatives, they spoke French. My father and mother were always singing French songs in the house. My father would read the French newspaper. My mother, she, she had a ton of French expressions, you know, like she'd say, asseyez-vous, which means sit down. Or she'd say, bonne nuit, every night, good night. Marie's family were parishioners of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary Parish in Chicopee. Marie also attended Assumption School just across the street. Both were places where French Canadian heritage was practiced and maintained. After the Mass, you know, people had Réveillon, which they would have a big uh, meal after the Midnight Mass. They would have meat pie suppers and with pea soup. And another tradition around the holidays or Christmas was fud making fudge. My father used to make delicious uh, chocolate fudge. The book cover features a 1931 Assumption Dramatic and Musical Circle group, which included members of her own family. They traveled around doing French plays. From what I gathered, they were pretty elaborate. And, you know, my mother's in here. She's very small. Um, she looks like she's about seven or eight years old. Mm -hmm. And then my meme, her mother, was uh, up here. During its five-year existence, many authentic French events and lectures were held in the Assumption Church Hall. Here, Marie met individuals with rich French heritages from across New England. Their stories served as the inspiration for the book. I saw how passionate they were about their heritage. And I would talk to them and they'd tell me about, um, they were researching their genealogy. Other people told me fascinating personal experiences that they had had. From 2013 to 2018, Pru Meter interviewed 23 Franco-Americans, some local and others from across New England, who told stories of courage, history, and culture. She recorded the interviews but didn't transcribe them until the pandemic in 2020, long after Chicopee's three French Catholic churches closed, including her beloved Assumption in 2009. I tried to keep the stories as accurate as I could as to what the people told me. I added in lots of historical information. In writing the book, Pru Meter learned a lot about many French Canadian contributions and accomplishments. Those interviewed came from all walks of life, including the building trades, which the French became known for. Marie's father was a painter and carpenter. And for me, they were very educational and inspiring. So, like, one woman's ancestor traveled with the French missionary, converting the Hurons in Quebec. Another woman was involved with a bill in Connecticut to establish French Canadian Day. 
One woman traveled to St. Anne de Beaupre Church in Quebec for 25 years to help there with the handicapped people. And then another woman, her grandfather was a carpenter. He built 36 churches in Quebec. So that, that's pretty impressive too. So there was a mother and an aunt who made a living as seamstresses. Well, they were making wedding gowns with the Skinner silk. So the Skinner silk is from the Skinner silk mill in Holyoke. When Marie cleaned her mother's wedding gown, an employee noticed a small tag on the back of the dress. Well, my eyes like popped open. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm like, did you say Skinner? <laughs> so here it was, and I never knew. The material from my mother's wedding dress was from the Holyoke Skinner Mills, and I just thought that was so amazing. Marie also spoke with a trio of local World War II veterans, Hector Tony Page, Francis Lamoureux, and Wilfred DeLude. They were among the 2,500 Franco-Americans from Chicopee who answered the call to serve. Marie's father was a vet. All the men left for war. So, you know, it, it, it was a very difficult time for the, for the families. It's important to remember them and, you know, what they did for us. In addition, Marie's mother Edna, her sister Jean, and her brother-in-law Romeo were interviewed. Although Prometer was unable to ultimately find a permanent site for the French Heritage Center, she continues to support French culture across New England. Last year, with her sister, Marie helped establish an annual French Day in Chicopee surrounding St. John Baptiste Day. The Quebec flag was raised to acknowledge and support French contributions to the city. Prometer also wants to construct a monument dedicated to the French Canadian immigrants who worked the mills and built the beautiful French churches. She wants its final resting place to be in Aldenville, which the French called Petite Canada. Mr. Alden, who uh, came and bought like 600 acres of land, built up the houses, and then he advertised, you know, in English and French for all the factory workers and, you know, all the mills and said, oh, come live in Aldenville. In addition to her mother's wedding dress, Marie has some other prized heirlooms. It's a locket that my grandmother gave me, my meme. And then I have my mother's um, St. Anne medal from the St. Anne Sodality at Assumption. I think she was in that for 50 years. I also have my grandmother's little, it's a little button with her image on it. Another cherished possession, which inspired Marie's career as a piano instructor, also came from her grandmother, a 100-year-old mandolin. My Meme played the mandolin. Um, and so she gave this to me when I was in college, and I actually went after college and took lessons on it. Marie's thankful for all the Franco-Americans she spoke to for their accomplishments, contributions. And most especially for their indomitable joie de vie spirit, which lives on in all of us who are proud to say, I am French-Canadian. For Real to Real, I'm Steve Kiltonic. If you're interested in buying a copy of Growing Up French, you can reach Marie via email at frenchconnection104 at gmail.com or by calling 413-592-4946. And we have that information also on iobserve.org. For this week, that's Real to Real. To keep up with the latest news on the Catholic Church in Western Massachusetts and around the world, head over to iobserve.org where we have 24-7 coverage. That's iobserve.org, and we are also on Facebook at Catholic Communications. And a quick note, in the fall issue of the Catholic Mirror, there was a reference to a celebration scheduled to honor Brother Terence Scanlon as he retires. Unfortunately, we will be rescheduling that Mass, but we will be announcing a new date in the near future, so stay tuned for that. And I will see you next week at this same time for Real to Real, your window on the world around you. See you then. Real to Real is a production of the Catholic Communications Corporation, funded in part by the annual Catholic Appeal, and the support of you, our faithful viewers.